welcome back to Season 2, Episode 9 of the Women of Rock Oral History Project podcast. I am your host, Tanya Pearson. This week, I spoke with a musician, artist, performance artist, perhaps the hardest working person in showbiz, uh, and all-around genius who goes by the name of Peaches. We discussed her childhood trajectory to success with the recording of Fuck the Pain Away and went all the way up to present day and life in the time of uh, quarantine. Please enjoy this interview with Peaches. I hope you can't hear my dog drinking water. He is also confused. (laughs) But we're just going to go for it. (laughs) All right. So um, first question is, where did you grow up? I grew up in uh, Canada, in Toronto, in a suburb called North York. And uh, I don't know much about your family. What did your parents do? And did do you have siblings or are you an only child? No, I have. I I. I yeah well I had two siblings I had I have a brother who's five years older than me and um, my sister passed away last year oh. who's three years older than me um, my parents were together until uh, three years ago when my father died they've been together for since my mom was basically fourteen and my dad was seventeen yeah. Um, my father was, um, he uh, grew up, you know, his father was a carpenter. His, they were immigrants from Poland and uh, he was shared a, a very tiny room with his brother. He, they always had people um, staying with their family to um, also to bring them over from the old country, as they called it, or, uh, but also to, to, you know, to help people and also pay yeah. some rent. Um, there's stories of like my, my grandparents would sleep, you know, in the dining room. So they give up their bed so that people would have it. Um, one person who stayed with them was uh, quite, quite a baseball fan. And taught my dad how to play baseball, would take him out and teach him. And my dad became a uh, semi-pro baseball player because of it. He um, he got discovered in um, this uh, small uh, park near their house, uh, downtown Toronto, called Christie Pitts. And um, yeah, he, he was on his way to be a pro baseball player. He played for the Cleveland Indians farm team. And... Uh, uh, when he was 20, his, his mom passed away and he, he felt a sense of loneliness and, and wanted to, um, be near my mom and, uh, decided to get married instead and, um, to come home and he became an accountant and, um, started life that way. Never, never regretted it. Uh, love, respect. And my mom was the most, the smartest most beautiful woman he ever knew. He would say that for life. You don't hear a lot of those stories anymore. <laughs> the couple staying together that long. Um, and yeah. I'm, really, I'm sorry to hear about your your sister too. Just this year, I'm really sorry. Yeah, that's a big one. Yeah. Um, but. W- what was at, what was your relationship like with your siblings when you were growing up? So you were the uh, yeah. So I was the youngest, and um, yeah. Um, so uh, my mother was very focused on you know being being a mother and uh, you know work being at home, being a good mother. Uh, my brother was super into music, you know, it was, uh, he was five years older than me. He was born in, uh, 61. So super like, you know, we, we listened to a lot of like just rock radio, but also AM radio. AM radio was huge. 
and I, you know, I was, I, I, I wasn't really big in school. I wasn't really, but I love to memorize songs just to, in my head all the time. I'm not answering your question, but I will get there because yeah. you asked about my sibling, but somehow AM radio was on all the time. So by 73, I mean, 60, I'm born in 66. Like by the time I was seven, I knew every single word to every song on the radio in 1973 on AM radio. Mm. Like to me, I would stay up like New Year's Eve and like listen to the top 100 of the year and write them down and like make bets with myself. Like I'm just like, oh, whoa, this, okay. Yeah, I knew that would make it. I knew 10 CC would make it to the top 10. And oh, Captain and Tennille, number one, disappointing or oh, wow. You know what I mean? Like, so like music was just everything to me everything in terms of just like uh, not even knowing that you could be a musician there was nobody musical in my family but uh i just i i loved it i just loved it my brother loved it too and and my sister too and i think that's we really came together a lot with that especially it was funny cuz my brother had his music my sister had her music my brother was like I'll just set the mood. So he had a water bed and he had made his own light system in his room with like switches. So one switch would be a strobe. One was like a construction light that he stole and they would hook up. One was like a black light with the black light poster. So, you know, you'd be listening to the Beatles. You'd listen to like uh, uh, ELO and um, listen to, I don't know, all the class. He loved Yes. He used to make like, drawings of yes and you know and my sister would was like loved you know they both loved early genesis and you know stuff like that and my sister was also but then my sister would be like she loved earth wind and fire you know and um uh stuff like that and then for me the first album where i was like this is my music this is not my brother's music it's not very it's like a weird choice but it was kate bush the kick inside that's cool. <laughs> I was like, this is not my brother's music. This is not my sister. This is mine. This is me. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. Um, you know, my parents, my my dad loved to sing. He was always like, I should have been a singer. You know, like, but he didn't really care. But he was, he was cute. He'd always sing around. Uh, my mom was like, Carly Simon, You're So Vain was her favorite song, you know. Um but we had like, you know, we were Julie Louie family. So it was like Bette Midler, Barbara Streisand, <laughs> Neil Diamond. I remember when You Don't Bring Me Flowers, I heard it on the radio and I ran into my parents' room. I'm like, you're never going to believe it. <laughs> Barbara Streisand and Neil Diamond, they, they, did a, they, they have a duet and they didn't care. They were like, yeah. I'm like, no, but these are the two people that you brought me up on. Like, what? why don't you care? And I was like, they did a duet. So you understand what that means? <laughs> it was like this big moment for me. But um, yeah, I'm just going to go on talking. And if you don't like where I'm going, you can shut me down. Um, but, can I uh, jump in for a second? Yeah. Um, I do like what, I do like what <laughs> you're saying. I do like what you got going on. Um, but I want to know a little bit more of like what kind of kid. You, I know you said and you've spoken about that you were not a very good student that you got made fun mm -hmm. of for being uh, Jewish. Um, no, not at, not at school. Cause I went to a Jewish school. It's just sometimes, you oh, know, when you were like walking the, home. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, but just what kind of kid were you in general? You know, now you're like, you seem yeah. pretty outgoing oh. in your performances. And yeah. Stuff. yeah no, I, I mean, I loved, I love to just um, put on music and dance around the house and make up, you know, you know, that normal kid stuff and sing along with stuff. But I was quite, quite whiny and quite a little bit like sulky and, you know, but I, I, I always had friends and, but yeah, there was like, I, I think my year in school, we were, we were not very, it wasn't a very nice group of kids. And it was always like, you know, gang up on today's the day that we hate her. Today's the day we hate her. And I was part of it, of course. I was like, go along with the gang, you know? Mm -hmm. So it was really, it's just kind of sad way to grow up. And But I remember that my day for being hated was the last day of school. 
So I remember spending all summer once like, everybody hates me. And then the first day of school, going to school and being like, everybody hates me. And I get to school and I was like, hey, hi, how was your summer? And I'm like, oh, cool. Okay. Nobody remembers that they hated me, you know, stuff like that. Um, yeah. So, uh, yeah, really found a lot of um, solace and a lot of warmth in in music, you know. Um, yeah, I, uh, I don't know. I'm going to tell a story, but um, so when I was seven, you know, we had a lot of half our family lived in New York. So my uh, cousin had a bar mitzvah. And so we went to his bar mitzvah and I saw a ba- the band. There was a band for the bar mitzvah. And it was probably the first time I'd seen like a band. And I said to my mom, can I sing with the band? And she was like, I don't know. Can you sing? And I was like, I think I can. So she said, why don't you ask the band then? So I remember they were on a break and they're eating their dinner and <laughs> like singing. And of course, all I knew was Barbara Streisand. So I sang the way we were or something, you know. And so he's like, yeah, yeah, I think we could do that. So I sang the way we were. And then I became that that kid who sang the way we were at every yeah. occasion. So, oh, your cousin's getting married. Will you sing the way we were? <laughs> okay. Oh, blah, blah, blah. And so from like seven to 17, I would sing the way we were at every occasion. And, the, you know, and that's how. And that gave me sort of like a leg up on, on a on confidence and and belonging in the family, because I felt a little you know, displaced or, mm. yeah. So, then I remember when I was seventeen or I learned I started to or eighteen I started to learn electric guitar and my cousins got married and I was like I'm gonna do piece of my heart and play guitar at your wedding I am not. I don't care what you're writing. I'm singing "Piece of My Heart." <laughs> <laughs> did you do it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I did it. Oh, okay. I mean, they yeah, yeah. do it. Yeah, yeah. They let me do it. I don't think I did it very well, but I did it. Yeah, that's okay. Yeah, I did it. Yeah. Um, I know. Uh, well, I listened to your interview with Shirley Manson, The Jump. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, and love her. And uh, I, 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 I also listened to your interview with her. So. That's oh, the one oh, I, you, you guys said. Yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 Oh, man. Yeah. I almost, it's like, if I could go back, it's like, I was so fucking nervous. You know, I had to, I was like in an elevator with Shirley Manson, like silence. And then in this room, <laughs> it's, yeah, if I could go back and redo it, but she's a lovely person. And she's so very gracious, always yeah. making everybody feel yep. their own power yeah. and their own beauty. And she's like, I keep messaging her because I'm like, you're a really good interviewer. Like she asked oh, yeah. questions on that <laughs> podcast. I'm like, I think I'm going to steal some, if you don't mind. Like she gave me my dissertation topic for yes. her interview. And um, yeah, she's really smart. But you were both talking about sort of starting like later in life, your <laughs> careers, which is not really that much later, but you know, Debbie Harry, you, you, uh, late twenties, early thirties. Um, Chrissy Hind. Yep, Chrissy Hind. Um, and so I which think is, this, which is why I mentioned them both in Fuck the Pain Away. Yes. Yep. Um, but I sort of, I kind of just want to like fill in the, uh, you know, what you kind of did in your tw- in your twenties. So if you could talk a little bit about your kind of high school experience if you had any um aspirations to do music after high school and then like what you ended up doing or how you kind of fell into teaching yeah so um like I said it wasn't a very good student wasn't so interested but somehow we had an incredible theater program we had this theater program where it was divided because we had three semesters. So it was divided into three semesters and we worked in a black box. Mm-hmm. Like, so it would just be like, here's your assignment, do it. And the last semester was splitting up the 10th. We had grade 13, yep. Canada, grade 13. So 
the last semester was, I'll say it for American, 10th graders were the actors, 11th graders were the producers, uh, or, or uh, 11th graders were the actors, uh, 12th graders were the producers, and 13th graders were the directors. So I was like, I cannot wait till I'm in, you know, grade 13 and I'm going to be a director. You know, so so I did that, you know, I, I just stuck with um, theater and I would do a lot of projects in this black box, which gave me a lot of confidence and a lot of creativity. And I could incorporate music in it in any way I wanted. But I never thought, like I said before, that I could be a musician because there was no musicians in my family and I had no musical education. Um, you know, I would see musicals because sometimes we go to New York and see a Broadway show. So I, I didn't really realize that it was more music. I thought it was theater. So I focused on that, did that whole thing and actually went to university for theater directing. And at university, I, um, very un, in an unpopular way said, I want to make cool musicals. That's what I want to do. And everyone's like, musicals? Ugh. Like, what are you talking about? I'm like, no, 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 I'm going to make cool musicals. It's going to be good. You know, and then it was really like, mm -mm. you know, like not understanding at all. But maybe also I, I was in the wrong field, you know. But I remember doing like lighting assignments. You would have to pick a, a piece of work to do a lighting assignment. I would pick like, spinal tap and do like lighting assignment to it or like so I didn't it wasn't really it wasn't doing like learning the sophisticated theater that I was supposed to supposed to do or whatever mm -hmm. and um I literally dropped acid one day I've only dropped it twice in my life and then the next day went I am not supposed to be in this program I am getting out now <laughs> and like <laughs> dropped out of it the second year but then took a bunch of other arts, which was really important for me to just understand. Because I didn't really even know what art school was. Yeah. So I didn't know it could be a music. I didn't know what I was. I just had heard music on the radio, seen musicals, seen, you know, Tommy, the musical, which was I was obsessed with. Saw Rocky Horror and Phantom of the Paradise, the Brian De Palma film. Those were, I saw them before they were cult films somehow where I spent my summers, they snuck me in when I was really young and changed my life. Um, so I just thought it was musicals, but it was music. So I remember when I got out of university, I needed a job. I was playing acoustic guitar. So I became a, uh, a daycare teacher, but it was so boring. I, I took kids and I started to play songs and I would make up these stories and the kids would act them out. And I it became a way, uh, a daytime job for me. So um, I continued doing that and I became very successful teaching kids in um, daycare centers and in, and in schools and private uh, after schools and things like that. And at the same time, I was developing um, a love for acoustic guitar and uh, discovering uh, people like uh, the Indigo Girls and Tracy Chapman and, uh, you know, like Melissa Etheridge. Mm -hmm. And I had a girlfriend at the time. I was like, they're all gay. <laughs> yeah. They're all, they're all lesbian. You know, like, so, and we, and then we started writing songs together. Um, no, no, actually we didn't. We got a job opening for somebody. Actually, she got a job opening. And then I said, can I play with you? I play acoustic guitar. We weren't seeing each other anymore at that time. So we were writing songs about how we hurt each other. <laughs> but That's but we're like harmonizing. Gay. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And, <laughs> and harmonizing about it. Um, we had a very popular song and we had a very popular following of young Jewish girls, actually, <laughs> who would come to our sneak into our shows and cry. And um, yeah. And after a while, I didn't want to do acoustic music anymore. And I was like, oh my God, I could use all this stuff that I liked in theater. I could be my own director. I could be my own stage designer. I could be, I could do, you could take all that theater stuff and I could be the writer and I can be the performer. Revelation. So then I was just like, let's go. And then I, um, you know, tried out a bunch of stuff and then 
um, was in bands and found more of a like a, a sexual freedom and the power in it and um, and felt more comfortable with myself and what I wanted to say when I turned more like 30. And then um, started to, oh, I thought synthesizers were uncool because they were in rock music. That was like, no, you can't have. But then I did a jam with people. We became a band called The Shit. But in that jam, there was a synthesizer. And I was like, oh, synthesizer, amazing. Whatever my idea was, that's wrong. And then ended up buying this machine that was synthesizer and could be a whole band. And I was like, I am the band now. Now I can do everything myself. And um, thus, then Peaches was born. And very confusing to people because it was like, is this performance art? Is she taking this seriously? Why is she talking about sex directly? Is this rock and roll? Why is she engaging the audience? What is she turning? Is she making music? Is there any music here? What's going on? <laughs> like It was really... <laughs> Yeah. And to me, it was all these influences, too. Like, you know, um, like uh, somehow at our early school dances, we really, you know, I was obsessed with school dances and dancing. And, you know, uh, there was a lot of early hip hop and a lot of disco and a lot of rock. And I had no problem with all of them. You know, my brother was a was a pure disco sucks person. And my sister would go to. The Linkers, which was like the strip, strip, uh, strip mall disco club for underage kids. You know, I was even too young to go to that. But so, yeah, I was incorporating all that. <laughs> My dad would, you know, listen to Donna Summer in the car, and mm -hmm. so uh, yeah, it's just all that kind of stuff. So confusing, but but captivating for people. But more like. I can't leave the room. Do I hate this or love this? What am I watching? Yeah. I remember it was, I mean, I remember hearing uh, Fuck the Pain Away for the first time. And it was this weird kind of moment, you know, the, like around the year 2000 when we'd seen this like feminist kind of backlash in rock music. So it was like garbage and hole and all those people kind of went away. And then it was like Britney Spears, boy bands, new metal. And then all of a yeah. sudden, you know, I remember I heard it just from like friends playing it. Oh my God, you got to listen to the song. And I had the same, you know, I'm like, what, like, what is this? What genre is this? <laughs> like, is this cool? Like, is this a joke? Is this rock music? But I was just like, this, whatever it is, it's fucking awesome. And I'm wondering, like, I do want to know about your kind of um, trajectory to you know, becoming kind of like an underground indie celebrity with fuck the pain away and getting signed and all of that. But also, uh, yeah, I never really got signed, but we'll get into that. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Cause I do like talking about like independent labels versus kind of major labels. And, um, so I guess just, just that whole trajectory, right. From like playing in bands to becoming peaches to recording teaches of peaches and then just what was that like? Because in, in my world, um, that album and that song was huge. So from going to... Like, do, you, do you know the story of the song? Um, I know what I heard on your podcast with Shirley. Um, but yeah, I mean, if you, if you want to like, if you want... Yeah, no, I, I, yeah, I can, of course. Yeah. I just, so... Um, yeah, I, I, like I said, I got this uh, instrument, the Groovebox MC505, and I had been playing, you know, been experimenting at this point now with guitars and drums and playing all instruments and synthesizers and loving craft work and loving, you know, um, the runaways and loving, like, um, you know, uh, salt and pepper, you know, so it's just like just playing some sometimes transferring stuff from an electric guitar and then putting them into the machine and things like that. And I, I, I would program stuff, but make it um, loose just because I didn't know how to program a whole song, make it loose. So also I could play it live on on stage. And with that song, um, I had done kind of like a little bit of versions of it and 
uh, I opened for Howie Beck, my friend, who's an acoustic guitar player and a producer at a small club called the Rivoli in Toronto for maybe 10 people. Mm-hmm. And um, the first song, I was like, okay, I'm going to try out this song. And I just did, you know, said, did, said some of the lines I knew. Suck, I knew that I would sing like sucking on my titties like you wanted me, which actually was like thinking I first thought of, when I thought of that line from you're a real tough cookie with a long history, <laughs> breaking little hearts like you wanted me, sucking on my titties like you wanted me. I don't know why, why I went from there to there, but I did. And um, that started it and fuck the pain away. I think it was just, I was going through a very painful time and uh, discovering, you know, that. Uh, so I played that song first in my set and I don't know. I just kind of played it. You can hear in the, in the, uh, yeah, I played it in the set. And then uh, at the end of the set, the uh, sound person, she said, Hey, I recorded your set on a cassette tape. You got five bucks. I'll give you the cassette tape. I'm like, sure. I almost said no, but I was like, yeah, sure. I should listen to it. And I listened to the first song and I'm like, oh, it sounds cool. I mean, my voice sounds pretty loud compared to the recording. It's kind of lo-fi. I'll put it on a demo and I'll ask people their opinion and I'll put some other songs on it that I'm working on. Just, you know, because I'm looking for a producer, maybe I should record this stuff. And I would play for people and they'd just be like, that sounds really cool. Not like, oh, you know what's wrong with the recording here, which usually you get like, Oh yeah, I could record that better. It'd be really cool if we, uh, you know, distorted your voice or we did it all through the tubes or whatever. Nobody said any of that. They just said, "Cool song," and I was like, "You know what? Song's cool. This is done. I am never recording this again. This is the first time I ever played it, and I'm just gonna, you know, vibe." <laughs> yeah, it's so funny. After when you mentioned that in your. Uh the jump podcast, I went back and listened to it because I had never noticed that it was a live recording. Yeah. My, my taste is like, I like lo-fi kind of stuff. And I always loved the way that it sounded and you can, you can like hear, you know, someone or people in the background. (laughs) Yeah. You you hear my first fan go, woo. Yeah. Okay. That was it. Yeah. I was like listening. Oh my God, this is live. Yeah. And I've had people, I've had people ask me like, Hey, what's that sample? That woo sample. Yeah. I'm like, that's a person. That's my first. Fan. <laughs> yeah. That's like, yeah. Um, I mean the other, and the other songs were recorded, you know, just through the machine. I, I would just do the mix in the machine. Cause I figured if I did everything in the machine, then it would all kind of sound in the same world and be easier. And then I decided, you know, I'm going to produce this myself. Mm-hmm. I mean, I've moved on also now you know, to have producers and, and, but to me, it was very important at the beginning to establish the sound and, um, yeah. And I also like my first songs, all of them were in the same BPM because I didn't even know how to change the BPM. So. Yeah. I feel like I'm still there. (laughs) Yeah. I'm still there. Yeah. But, um, yeah, if, if I, if I vibed with it, then that was it. And it was also just a, that's how it sort of developed. Like, how can I get the most maximal vibe out of it from the most minimal music and direct lyrics? Mm. Sorry, my dog's licking himself. One second. Hey, I don't lick yourself. Scared. Don't do that. It's fucking gross. Look. <laughs> but, um, okay, so we have half an hour. I'm speeding through, but I do want to know about. So you said that you've never actually been signed to a label. I could very well. I I was I you know when I was um when I, so I I came I came to Berlin. I uh, had a cassette. My friend lived here already, um, and I was like, "Here's a cassette of six songs." I released it in Canada with a very tiny label, and told them like I was going to Berlin to visit a friend. Um, maybe something will happen. I don't want to be exclusive with you. Whatever. Fuck the pain away was on that um, demo. I, like. Half the album was on that yeah. demo, you know, and Lover Tits was on there. And um, I remember I played, uh, no, what happened was that? Yeah, whatever. I met those people before when I was just not even singing, just playing stuff. And they asked, 
if I could come back with my friend and play a festival, he stayed there. He got signed to them. Kitty O was this yeah. tiny, tiny label, tiny label. They had a tiny office. It's probably, you know, it was as big as your bedroom. Quite seriously, I would walk in. Not that your bedroom's tiny, but for a whole label, there were three people working there and they would have this little room. And then once they signed, you know, Gonzalez and me, all of a sudden they had this huge office. <laughs> Not that, it, no, but things were quite cheap still in Berlin, you know, but they were like, no, but they were like, hey, we're going to sign you. And I'm like, great. Um, you know, at that time, because the internet wasn't what it is today and everything, I'm like, I'm going to move to Berlin. Like I saved enough money as being a teacher and everything and it's time to get into it like take it take it for real so um yeah I got signed to Kitty Yo and then then there was a single set it off mm-hmm. that they that they sold they wanted to sell to Sony we want to do the Sony single of set it off with a remix you know remixes and um uh we want to do one with toby neumann who did more like just a kind of more funky version of you know set it up and they wanted to do a like a major label release and i was like this is great because then my album will get out more and but they you know i i didn't you know even though i was old enough to know i didn't really think about that they would bury the album for the single and then the person who was interested of course like it always is in the industry who was in the dance department got fired and then the person who knew dance department was like who is who's this person what are we doing you know like it always happens and then it just doesn't even register to anybody and then um i would go on these promotional tours with sony people and there was like no soul, no love. And also the interviews, you know, they were bigger, better things, but they were also like, they didn't seem genuine. And I really already had had two years of very genuine, just people who wanted to talk to me because I wasn't on the radio. I still wasn't on the radio, but because of my language, you know, time and timing, um, I didn't have a, a, a I, I made my own super eight videos for songs. So they would play them, you know, late night or whatever. Yeah. Um, I did get on like 120 minutes on MTV. That was like a big deal for me. Yeah. But um, yeah, I didn't have radio play. There wasn't really like an internet uh, outlet for that. So um, then I was doing this this genuine with like some some rock A and R dude who really couldn't did not give a fuck about me and did not yeah. understand what I was doing, which is fine. But you don't want to hang around that. And it, then it made me really sad for people who get these major label deals and that's their life. That's what they think it is. Like nobody, nobody's with them. And I'd already had this really authentic experience. So I went through it. Um, they buried the album for eight months. Um, I made a video for set it off where I picked a very, very aesthetic, Direct, they asked me to pick a director. They had to pick the director. It was when, when I'd already been making my with friends all these super eight cool videos. So now I'm like, I'm gonna make a cheesy video. I'm gonna do the cheesy guy and I'm gonna subvert it. I'm gonna have like guys making out and girls making out and you know, like it was a different, different time. And but actually, no, what I really wanted to do is just be in a room and grow hair, just dance by myself in a white room. And I wanted hair to grow. So first I wanted my eyelashes to grow, then my hair and then armpits and then this hair. And, you know, I thought it'd be a really cool video. And they were like, no, we need club life. We need other people. We need. So it turned into like a disaster. And then they had all, you know, models and whatever the dancers and they were all like doing ecstasy and touching each other, whatever. It's just not the vibe. It was very, heteronormative kind of and I'm in a, a bathroom growing hair yeah yeah so and I'm like hey why can't I be in those scenes <laughs> <It's a bit. laughs> and then and then they had gotten one girl they had hired to kiss other girls in the thing and I was like hey if you're gonna do that first can I know and can we have a guy doing the same thing and they're like, and it was the one of, there were two directors and one was was gay and he was like no you, you can't do that it won't play it, the video and I remember two weeks later you're beautiful um, by Christina Aguilera came out where two guys were kissing a video and it was such a huge deal. And I was like, I wasn't like, no, I want to do it. first. I was just like, 
see, you guys are fucking idiots. Yeah. That's all I was thinking. I was like, yes, yes, Christina Aguilera. And like, yes, artists know what, you know, like it, it was just kind of like time and place and really eye opening in that way that I was trying to subvert it and then didn't have the control I wanted to. Because first I just wanted me to grow hair in a room, which I still think would be. I mean, I love uh, awesome lots of videos. Yeah. And like just. The it, yeah. 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 And, but it was really funny too, because it was fun to watch these very, um, you know, straight cameramen having to like film me with a lot of, you know, pubic hair. And they were really like, they were really vocal and, and about it. It was just like, that's inappropriate. That is, you know, like, how are you having, like, how are you allowed to be, yeah. anyway, you, you know, so like, you can really feel like the time and place, like, how are they allowed to go like, oh, this is so inappropriate. Oh, you know, it's like, <laughs> your video, why are you in the, even in the shoot? Why are you hired? Like, you know, so, so that was quite an experience. And then they buried the album. And then I really wanted this album to have a life. So XL was interested. And um, I went with XL. Yeah. And XL, they're, are they technically an independent label? I did technically, like technically. I can't like I can't tell. I don't know what's. Uh, I don't know either. And they're technically okay, but then you know they've they've since signed very you know. At that time, it was still uh, independent people, and then yeah. it's been different since then. So okay. And then you, and then there was another, well, I don't know if it's a label or, um, I use, I use she is me. Okay. That is just you. All right. Yeah. So, yeah. I use she is a, a song from father fucker. Yeah. So, okay. Um, so given your experience, uh, like with Sony, um, with XL, um, I mean, how, how did those experiences sort of like gear you toward, you know, now just kind of like releasing your own music or keeping it really independent like it was in the beginning? Like, would you consider the experiences on Sony and XL um, bad or negative? Were there positives? Um, well, the Sony one, I would um, say that it was um, unnecessary. But it turned out good for me because I don't think Kidio could have taken it any further. And um, I think XL gave it new life and they were really excited about that album. So even though it turned out um, that they didn't feel like they could take it any further either in the same way because the time and place, maybe now it would have been different, but um, because of all the explicitness that isn't even so explicit anymore you know what I mean so um so at the at the time they couldn't figure out a way to get over themselves you know but it but at the same time you know you had a song like um uh I want to fuck you like an animal which is on the radio so mm. yeah why can't you have you know fuck the pain away when everybody was really into that song but it would never yeah. you know they couldn't find a way to just bleep that out you know yeah so um interesting sexism <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. um so but you know it was it also got a lot of life because it was in the sofia coppola movie you know um uh was <laughs> lost in translation yeah so you know and then and it's continued that song continues to have a life of its own from like being on south park which i i think are brilliant to you know 30 rock to i know a million other sinks to two weeks ago being on sex education and yeah. it turns into like a, a glee type um acapella song which is really bizarre yeah i thought it was but real yeah no it's 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 amazing and um and it's funny because it's a song that always says like it's so self-referential like 
as the artist, what else is in the teacher's peaches? So everybody always has to say what else is in the teacher's peaches, which is hilarious. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, you know, also the point of, of um, everyone has titties. So sucking on my titties is just titties, you know? So um, bringing that into, you know, going on where all my lyrics actually are, especially the early ones are questioning mostly male rock songs asking why am I saying like spread your wings and let me come inside to like a underage virgin or um you know squeeze 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 my lemon till the juice runs down or a big legged woman ain't got no soul you know like all these things like I'm like why am I singing I gotta turn these around so um okay so I definitely don't want to do like a discography because I feel like people can just Google that. Um, but there are certain things that I want to know that I've always found very like confusing or mysterious as a music fan and like a failed musician myself. Um, how it's never often, too late. <laughs> it's, it is never too late. And on, like people who watch these interviews, they always say, Oh my God, thanks for asking. Like, the money question or just like, how do you make a living? Or, I mean, it's re- there's yeah, like this yeah. myth that I was discovered. And then all of a sudden I can just like make a living being a musician, but what actually, like how often did you and do you perform and tour? Um, were you <laughs> able to make money after teaches of peaches just doing music and performance, or did you still have to like work other jobs? How do you make and, uh, in this age doing what you do? I, well, in this age is, is a very interesting question because the last two years have been totally different. Yeah. So um, I'm going to do a pre-pandemic and a post-pandemic answer to that. Okay. So pre-pandemic is I just didn't know how to say no. And um, because, uh, you know, Teachers Peaches album did not make money. <laughs> I think it still only probably sold like under a hundred thousand copies worldwide. Who knows? Maybe, I don't know. Something like that. Like a, maybe I'm wrong now. I don't know. I really definitely under, under 250,000 copies, but yeah, I don't. Yeah. So, <laughs> I mean, none of my albums really make money, but I'm a, a tour maniac. Mm-hmm. Um, Father fucker, which was like to the industry was like, what a disappointment. It was probably like the most, I would say the most poignant album of all of them for also um, people's stories about how they found me or, or how they were inspired by me or um, to get in, even in deeper about what I was uh, um, sort of like uh, gender spectrum exploration. So it was a little bit, uh, I think, very um, powerful album to me with songs like Back It Up Boys about, talking about, um, you know, uh, uh, how prosthetics make it more pleasurable for it to be poked in the butt and how instead of guys always, you know, I'm a backdoor man or whatever you want to call it, <laughs> you know, and, um, or songs like I, you, she, which, you know, talk about like all different combinations, which I have updated to. I, you, they, I, you, you know, um, which is very powerful for people. And, um, you know, the, the album cover now is quite cartoony, but at the time also to have the beard, which was kind of my respect to Jennifer Miller, who comes from a long line of very, um, uh, like hairy women who always tried to very hard to, to, uh, hide their hair. And she had made this, sex calendar where she she kept her beard and showed her her gorgeous body and I was very inspired by her bravery and or just her just celebration of herself to be honest so um yeah so so that album is even to me more of a underground hit and even that the fact that people couldn't say the na- the title of the album you know they couldn't say father fucker but it just became really um, important for people. Um, so I just always toured and I had a really, I just had a very strong performance. I never really, 
added a lot of glitz or anything. It was just the power of my performance and communication. It was very punk rock and roll uh, sort of presentation, very real, very raw. And I would probably tour like a hundred days out of the year. I just didn't say no. Yeah. I would tour an album for like three years, then make another album and then tour again. So. Okay. Oh, so that's why, because yeah, a lot of times there were like three or five years in between. Mm. Yeah. Albums. Yeah. So I would tour like teaches of peaches, you know, got released again in 2002. So yeah. And then father fucker three years later, impeach my bush three years later, I feel cream. And then I did actually a musical uh mockumentary musical of myself so there i got to do my cool musical in the oh. end <laughs> which which i always didn't realize oh there i have all the information i've just experienced it all in my you know mm -hmm. and then um yeah i did other projects and then came back with rub um and tore that for like four years and um Shit. Yeah, and then did these in incredible, huge anniversary shows with like 13 musicians and two dance troops and guests and um, and did a huge sort of like um, art big, uh, installation, uh, immersive work and things like that. And then, boom, pandemic. So, uh, yeah, I haven't really played or got my normal income for the last two years. Um, I am lucky with Fuck the Pain Away and Boys Want to Be Here because they are always a good source of um, sinks. People want to use them to like, yeah, for their movies, for their TV shows, for, so that, that has helped me through a lot. Okay. Um, and, and they're great songs that I love how they use them to represent whatever they're representing. So I, I am controlling that. Um, of course. So, yeah. Um, I'm also curious. So you're living in Berlin again. And I think Father Fucker was actually like your first album that charted in the U.S. at all. I think it, I'm pretty oh, sure it was Father Fucker. But um, I'm wondering uh, yeah. like how, is it, I've just heard that like Europe is cooler. And a lot of artists, you just heard that. <laughs> no, I've heard it a lot, but I try to say it politely. Like I just, um, well, a lot of well, artists go to Europe to like make and you know work the way that they want to work. What is and then come back to the states and make money? <laughs> yes, <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. Just like what is? How do you feel you've been sort of received in the United States versus Europe? Is it harder to? And I know you're Canadian. Um, no. I think that for me, it's kind of like the same across the board for in terms of like Europe, just because of what I do and, and the, you know, I, I'm not insanely huge anywhere, but I love, I have the best, you know, really great audiences everywhere I go. It sounds like I love my fans, <laughs> but no, it's like, I'm sure everybody says that, but um, yeah, no, I, I think that I think, uh, this, you know, English as a first language, understand me a little bit better, uh, you know, um, so that is because because of lyrical content, it is, you know, but uh, and get all the little innuendo jokes and things like that, because I did um, uh, this theater piece where it turns into a I didn't do it but they asked me to do this Brecht piece that turns into a pizza show and it was a very German audience because it was in Stuttgart and um they had to translate my lyrics and people were like wow these did not translate as all they don't trans like they treat Brecht you know as poetry when they make it in English but people were like it's not translating it just sounds like you're saying dick hole you know what people Dick hole, pussy, bum, tit. Um, but, you know, they were saying, like, we we get the language and the wordplay, and it's unfortunate that that doesn't come through. But the energy does in the live show. So in saying all that, I think that it's um, satisfying to play in America mm -hmm. to an audience when they're 
they know the lyrics and England too. I remember playing once in London and just the last rub tour. I just did like, it was more like a DJ show where I just sang the rub tour and everybody sang every lyric. And it was so exciting, but that changes in Europe too, with the internet and <laughs> everybody understanding. So yeah, I, I love playing in America because yeah. of also the struggle Oh well, yeah, the struggle is real. <laughs> the struggle is real, and I want to be there for it. Yeah. No, everything's great. Everything is going great over here. Good times. Uh, <laughs> yeah. It's gonna be fine. Um, okay, I'm cramming in these last questions. I do want to know. So you adopted the stage name Peaches, Peaches. Uh, yeah. very early on. Um, how much of you like off the stage is peaches? Is it like a hundred percent persona? Um, are you two different people or is peaches like an aspect of yourself? Yeah, definitely an amplified, an amplified version, you know, Mm -hmm. and, um, yeah. And it's, I mean, it's disappointing sometimes for people that it has to be a character. You're not talking one-on-one with someone. You are talking to 500, 1,000, 3,000, 5,000, 10,000, you know, that's a different mode. That is a different way of communicating. So. And um, <clears throat> you do so many different kind of things. Like obviously you're a musician, but you work in all these multiple genres. I'm just, I just want to know, um, like how you would define yourself more as a musician, an artist, a performance artist, um, or just a kind of combinate or a, a performer. Yeah. All those things, all those things. Yeah. Is one think kind of like more important than the other? Or does one, I, it all starts at music. It's all inspired right. by music, but I think that more and more, um, I, I think the young kids today are doing this more and more, you know, it's like less of a purist, just understanding that it's it's just all, you know, expression. And also the the tools that are available to people now make it easier for them too. Do you think that that's a good thing or, or a, a bad thing? It depends. Hey, it's always depending on how you use it, you know? It's all on how you use it. So good art and bad art, good, you know, good decisions, bad decisions. Yeah. Sometimes I find it hard to like sift through everything. It's hard. This like, uh, this. Yeah. It's easier to just go like I smoke and mirrors. I can do it this way, but yeah. Yeah. But there's still, there's good. And if you like it, you like it. It doesn't matter. Sometimes it might be really heavy technology that you're not usually into, but you're like, fuck this Bjork shit works you know whatever like no I don't mean Bjork shit but I mean like in terms of like Bjork and technology it was very different you know and like whoa what is that but it's working and that's how does there like some kind of punkness or rawness in this very you know in that in this very high tech kind of feeling that's what I mean by that. And then um, it's just, it's just, are you, can you, can you use the technology or whatever you want to use? Can you manipulate it in the way that can express what you want? Mm-hmm. And like you say, you like these one shot, you know, there's some people who can do that very badly too. And sometimes they get oh, done well, it can be really powerful. Okay, last few. I feel like now I'm really rushing. I think you're interesting though, so I'm only doing it because we're running out of time. I'm like, <laughs> yeah, okay, next. Um, <clears throat> I do. What is your uh, creative process when you sit down to write? What comes first? Do you write lyrics? Do you hear a beat? Do you think about um, the entire kind of performance? No, I I don't actually. Um, but maybe I do subconsciously, and then that kind of helps that makes me second guess and then it stresses me out and then I go back and then I give myself more time and then sometimes I'll write lyrics for this and I'll go to a different beat or 
you know, it's just, it's just all mixed up. <laughs> okay. Um, oh, and yeah, just before, so I have like the last three questions are questions that I ask every interviewee. Um, and the answers are all so diverse. It's really interesting. But before that, you <clears throat> are like a solo artist, <clears throat> but probably one of the most collaborative artists I have ever spoken to. Um, what have been some of your most memorable uh, collaborations with other people, whether it be, you know, videos or, or live performances um, or producers? Um, because I'm trying to think of like not asking someone to sing on my song or me sing on their song what what is the most like collaborative like in the true sense of collaborating um uh I think that it's as hard to say. Yeah. Um, Because I always feel like it was like, there was never like a true let's start from the, or was it, I don't know why I'm spacing out on this. If there was like a true moment where it's like, let's take this from the beginning. We have a no idea and let's take it from there. I'm, I'm waiting for that sort of collaboration where it's like, you know? Yeah. No, I know. Not, you. this is my idea. I sing on this. This is my, yeah. Okay. Yeah. I see what that means. That makes sense. Um, oh, I also, all right. I can do this in two minutes. I do want to know, uh, I'm just real nosy and I'm a lesbian spinster <clears throat> and I can't do relationships because I'm a workaholic. So I always ask everybody, is it hard to do or to have long-term relationships when you're like in the public eye and a yes. celebrity. <laughs> Why? Um, Cause you, you just always got to keep your ego in check and always take care of your true self and, um, and your partner and your relationship and the truth of it and the real of it. But I have a long-term partner. Oh, you do right now. Okay. Yeah. All right. Yeah. So not lonely, but it is difficult. Yeah. It's difficult for both of us. Yeah. Yeah. I guess I'm always wondering how people who are like super creative and, and work a lot, how you can kind we of. Both, we out. both are. Yeah. We both are. So it's just hard. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but it's worth it. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Maybe I'll get there. I don't know. You will. Thanks. Because. If you want to. Okay. You yeah, will I know. You I think to, I'm like you know. different about it, so I don't know. We'll see. Yeah. I'm only 40. Yeah, oh, well. <clears throat> I I'm love 50. That. I'm going to be 55. Next 55 next years old. I'll be 55. <laughs> me, me and Shirley. <laughs> yeah. Um, and <laughs> you both, like, say the same things about aging, which I like. Um, yeah. What Aging. In the public eye. Yeah, a- no, I, I think that's like, uh, yeah, I, I love when people say like, oh, you look good for your age. <laughs> no, I just look good. But yeah. so, yeah, no, I think I, uh, more and more I want to talk more about that in new records. And I think that's a good routing. Yeah, I appreciate that. And there's nothing more exciting to me than like, you know, going and seeing garbage now. I think it's like, more did you get to see oh, yeah she gave me tickets and I got to go like great okay I promise see, like my part my partner just handed me this oh some apple it's just like making hey, this making is what sure. I need no yeah I'm just like dating a heterosexual woman and that's just like uh-huh. that's just like my thing yeah that's what I mean like ambivalent it's not gonna work out it's fun, <laughs> it's fun. good times and I love working <laughs> okay just the last few questions that I ask <clears throat> everybody um, how do you feel about your role in and contribution to rock and roll history, whatever that may be, as a whole? 
fucking amazing. I can't even believe it. I can't even, I could never imagine. And wow, what a thrill. What an amazing feeling. I love it. I mean, I space at the end. To, to me, it was like, I always thought if I, and I still feel like it's kind of like the, how I feel about the cramps. Mm-hmm. I don't know why I, I, but I, this is how I feel about the cramps <laughs> and I don't mean, you know, period cramps, but it, it's just, I always felt like they were this underrated, but like, ah, oh, when you saw them live, you were, or you heard human fly or, you, you know, you're just like, this is amazing. Do you feel underrated at all? That's a, this is a, a Sometimes I don't even feel rated. <laughs> it's, 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 uh, I guess maybe, yeah, I don't feel underrated. No, I'm just amazed uh, how I've, yeah, how people have, yeah, rock and roll communities, electronic communities, queer communities, um, art communities. Um, older, older communities, young, younger communities. Um, but then there's, you know, a lot of people who are like, who, what, never will touch that. That is the horrible, you know. Those are usually pretty kind of like boring people anyway. <clears throat> um, and so I always ask this question, the, the title of this project <clears throat> is uh, fucking stupid. Women of Rock World History Project, but I just, I didn't know what else to call it other than the non-cis men oral history project. And that was too long. So one of the questions that I ask everybody, um, are gendered categories over? Is there any use in still sort of differentiating between men and women and other kind of gender identities in rock music? But even when you say it like that, it, it it tells me that there is when you're saying men, women, and then you're other, say other. So it's not other. Yeah. So, yes. I mean, yes. Okay. It's a spectrum and it's, uh, it's sensitive to people. And there's a huge, you can see now that it's opened up more, how many very young people young people have feelings about who they are and where they lie in the spectrum and they want to be, they want to be heard and they want to, you know, that's important. I mean, it's a construct that was made for certain reasons. You know, there's definitely the, the, the biological breeding aspect of it, but that's also, it's all constructs. So, Yes. Okay. Thanks, Peaches. And uh, <clears throat> what are you most proud of personally and or professionally? What am I most proud of? <sighs> that's, that's a, just that I got that, that I'm just able to, able to work, able to be seen, able to be understood able to be misunderstood, able to have a voice, able to um, live in, uh, a, a life I want to live, able to grow, also able to make personal mistakes, able to figure out who, who I am personally, which I think the pandemic has forced me into in a really painful way, but also very important. Yeah. Just most proud of yeah, trying to be a whole, whole person. Yeah. Okay, damn it. I feel like I could talk to you for three hours. I've done a couple six hour interviews, so. Um, wow, that's yeah. amazing. Well, they used to be in person. So you like go to someone's yeah. house, like start doing it, have a snack, come back. Um, have a snack. Yeah. Get some apple water. Yeah, no, seriously. <laughs> You know, oh, maybe it's peach. It's peaches water, isn't it? 
Uh, oh, yeah, because we're peach. Oh, no, no, it's not. <laughs> that's not what. Actually, our neighbor was like uh, at her garden and she picked too many peaches and she knocked on our door oh. and the neighbors. And she's like, I know this is funny, but I picked too many peaches. Do you want some? <laughs> it's really cute. Mm-hmm. Um, is there anything that I like? Have, I'm, there's a lot that I didn't ask you, but anything that we, you- we could we could do another sesh sometime. Really, go over your stuff and okay, we could do another. You know, yeah, I would, I would love to. Yeah, I could talk to you for hours and hours. All right, well, All right. thank you, and I will uh, touch base with you and um, okay, have fun drinking your peaches tea. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Tanya. <laughs> much for listening. Women of Rock Oral History Project is a DIY publicly funded and self-funded archive and we do accept donations year-round. You can follow us on Instagram and Twitter at Women of Rock OHP and on Facebook and you can check out all of the interviews on Vimeo, YouTube, or at womenofrock.org. Thanks for listening.